what is a rope around a wheel, and the Range Rover drives away and pulls the scooter, and it goes at speed like that. So I'm talking about 60 yards of ramp and 60 yards of rope. It goes like that, and it hits a board. And when it hits the board, it releases the scooter, and the scooter flies through the air. And they said to me, we've worked it out, we've measured it, we've put sand on it, we've done this, we've measured out the weight of it, and da da da, and we reckon it'll fly about a hundred, about 50 feet, uh, 50 meters off the, from the cliff. So I placed my cameras everywhere, and I put myself in the in the helicopter, a hundred yards off the cliff, just sitting there, you know, with the camera waiting, hovering, like waiting for the scooter to come flying out and change. They got the measurements wrong, the mathematics wrong. This is like day two of my film directing career. And suddenly this scooter is hurtling towards me and it missed the helicopter by about 10 feet. And they got their calculations wrong. It was extraordinary. I thought, I could remember thinking to myself, headline, director killed by scooter. When we did the riots in Brighton, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of extras involved in, in, uh, on the beach doing this big fight sequence. And I think we had also a couple of thousand people watching, so suddenly, again, that was improvisational luck. Well, there we were on the beach with all our, you know, I don't know, 600 extras and actors all, all going to have this big fight between the mods and the rockers with regular seaside holiday people in the middle of it, people with babies. This, this. It was quite a big scene, and I wanted to give it big, big energy, and I had all these people watching, so it was an incredible, incredible moment. <laughs> Of course, there were tons of extras and all these bikers clubs and scooter clubs from up and down the country had turned up. Because there was all these lads came down, went out, bought a pint of milk, and said to their wives, you know, up from Lancashire, I'm going to buy a pint of milk, love. And they all came down to Brighton to be mods. It was amazing. <laughs> I had 14 separate action cues. So, you know, I wanted to shoot the big master and then go into my close-ups. So I wanted the, the mods here, the rockers there, policemen arriving here, other rockers arriving there, policemen there, horses, you know, people being knocked over, all these stunts in the middle of it. And when I was shooting it, I noticed that when people do stunts normally in those days, they would use trampolines and things like that. So you punch a guy and he goes flying back in the air, you know, and all the fights look fake. So I got the... Uh, I got the stunt uh, coordinator to set up these bits of action, like regular stunts of people punching and kicking. But then I ran crowds through them so the punches couldn't be completed, the kicks couldn't be completed. So instead of looking like phony uh, stunts, they look like real action because they've been interrupted and pulled around and somebody is being moved slightly. Now the trouble with that is, of course, it's slightly dangerous. I cut my wrist there, that's from quadrophenia, that's coming off my scooter. Um, one of the, uh, Gareth, one of the stunt boys broke his leg. So there's a few, few crunches. What I remember mostly about making of the film was the riot scenes, because it was so massive, and we had occasions where all you knew that a camera was turning was this distant voice shouting action. There were so many of us, you couldn't ask advice, you couldn't ask where do I need to be. We were just being told fight. And I can remember going up to a man dressed as a policeman going, excuse me, are you in the film or are you real? And um, he said, no, I'm in the film. And I said, well, can I hit you? And he said, yeah. Action, bosh. You know, it, we, we literally had to negotiate everything in the spot ourselves. I had no idea what was going on a lot of the time, you know, we, there were groups of us in streets, you didn't know where the camera was, there were people with megaphones telling you what to do, and some, something you didn't hear, and a big group of people would dash off down the street and you just follow, you didn't know whether you were being filmed or not. 
At one point I attacked a policeman, he turned out to be a real policeman, who was holding the, the, the crowd back. He said, no, not me, son, I'm for real. You want the bloke over there in the old-fashioned the old Bobby's hat? <laughs> in the midst of the big shot in the beginning, we do this fantastic take, 14 cues, mods, rockers, policemen, public, uh, horses, dogs, the whole thing was fantastic. And suddenly, the camera operator said to me, it's not going to work, Gov. They always call you governor on English films, by the way. And, uh, and I said, why not? He said, well, some of the policemen running down were laughing, and also some of them had uh, helmets on back to front. And now these group of policemen were professional extras. Everybody else on the beach was real mods or real rockers. And they were really into it, doing it properly. The professional extras were we're just like, you know, like taking it for a ride. And I said, okay, we'll do it again. We set up again. It took like an hour to set the whole thing up. And I, would ju I was just about to say action. I said to the first assistant, act. And I said, stop. And I ran across the beach. I remember running through the beach of Brighton. And the stones are quite big. And running across. And I walk across these group of mods. And I said, listen, those policemen are completely screwing this shot up. I said, you know, go for them for real. And I ran back to my thing, and I said, action! And then this whole mighty fight broke out. The mods ran right across the policemen and started attacking them for real. And these extras, well, like, we normally just care about what cream cakes they're getting for tea, started, like, you know, fighting for their lives. And that's where the energy comes from. Now, yeah, I don't know what possessed me to do that. I just think it was ambition for the film. I always had a couple of bouncers near me, geezers that could sort of really have a go if it went off. But a lot of the things were very... happened very spontaneously, like that marching band just appeared. And uh, everybody was keen, you know. Everybody really loved it, because you were at that, that age where running down a beach and the police allowing you to have a riot is, is really quite good, isn't it? The cafe was really hairy. <laughs> one point where Pete's character has to throw a plant pot through a glass window at a, a fortune teller during the riots. And, um, and I said to her, look, he's the guy in the red leather coat, black hair. You watch him, and when he picks it up, you duck. And she's looking at the wrong guy. <laughs> so he hurls his plant pot through the window, this fortune teller's glass window, and she doesn't duck. I mean, it looks like it's hit her, but she, she just ducked at the last moment. So we had, you know, a lot of fun. And no, nobody got killed, by the way. We wanted to be our best for this film. We never reached a moment of apathy or despondency. No matter what was going on politically, no matter how hungry we were, no matter how neglected we felt, we wanted to be the best in this film. And in those riot scenes, we all gave everything. The Joe public who'd come down from Wigan, who'd come down from Newcastle, we, we all gave 110%. And in those riot scenes, we knew they wanted to see people fighting, so we just gave it all. And we were punching the shit out of each other. But it was with dedication. It was, we knew we were in something exceptional and we respected that. We had two or three weeks, I think it was a fortnight, when we got to know each other. And then we all went down to Brighton to film the first scenes down in Brighton, which were the riot scenes and the bits and pieces down there. And I think it was either the Saturday or the Sunday afternoon, Frank got us all in this hotel room and to have the script reading. And I remember getting halfway through it and Frank said, oh, let's not bother. Closing the book and then talking about what he wanted to do. So he used that script as a basis. And most of it, although we had, you know, some direction in each scene to take, we improvised. I got taught improvisation and that's where I'm from. And I think Frank, being a documentary filmmaker and this, that and the other, encouraged that, you know. Yeah, everything is very deliberate in the film. 
as it should be. You know, if you're a director, you should be, you know, on top of everything. And if lucky accidents happen, fantastic. But you've got to be on top. You improvise from a very ordered level. That's the position, I think. Some of the work from those improvisations find it, found its way into the script. There was a scene when I was actually auditioning where we were, we were doing an improvisation in Frank's house and we were supposed to be breaking into the place and we, all, we were camping out in the garden and all that. And it was supposed to be the chemist scene, you know, where they find the drugs. And, um, and just as we got inside, the phone rang. Perhaps someone's been nicking them. Fucking hell! And we all scarfed, we all ran back into the garden. And he put that into the, into the script as a way to break the scene. I've told me, come on! I'm just getting something from me, Mum. The party scene in the sort of house, I think Jimmy goes over and puts my generation on, which is a slight anachronism for when the film's set. And we all go mad, which is great. And in my enthusiasm, I jumped up and raised my hand and I broke this lamp. And it, the film was cut and I went over to Frank and said, I'm really, really sorry, expecting another bollocking. Because Frank used to bollock me quite a lot in those days. Because <laughs> I, was, I was very clumsy, let's say. Mark Wingate, who plays Dave, was only about 16 when he did the show. Very good actor, so he was in straight away. But he was very immature. All the young kids were staying in hotels together. Can you imagine? All these young actors, you know, hundred or so of them, they had wild parties. He turns up with a big love bite on his neck. And the assistant director tells him off, says, you know, you can't come on a set with those marks, you have to put makeup on you. And, and, you know, really ripped into him. He's 16 years old, he said, I'm going to leave the show. We were two weeks into shooting, he said, I'm going. I'm, I'm not, I'm, that's it, I don't care. Don't if I see you out here again, you're going to fucking kill you! And I thought, how the heck am I going to get him to stay? But I had in my possession the most precious object that I know he would love if I gave it to him. And this was a shirt once owned by Sid Vicious with puke on it. <laughs> I can't tell that story. And what had happened is that um, Sid had gone to see Johnny for some reason about something, and Johnny had come out and hit him on the head with an axe. And, <laughs> and Sid had puked up. <laughs> and I was given the shirt. It's a real punk trophy. So I gave this shirt to Mark Wingate. I hope you still got it, because I think it's worth a fortune. What was interesting about documentary uh, and film at the time, there was a very static quality about filmmaking before this. Not before my film, but in general. You know, you had setups like this, you know, wide shot, two shot, single, and they're very formal. And if you look at some of the movies, and funny enough, Woody Allen still shoots like that. You very rarely get anything other than, because he lets the performers work. And that was the style of filmmaking in the past. When I was making documentaries, because we were at the mercy of the action, the camera had to follow the actors. And what I realized is that that gave the film a very uh, good energy and also very re realistic quality. So instead of bringing the actors in and saying, I put my camera here, I'm already lit, you guys do your bit. I would bring the actors into the space and say, you do your bit, move how you'd like to move, show me how you'd like to move. And I'd let them move and I'd follow it with the eyepiece and I'd watch it and I'd see if they were, you know, and I'd say, that's great, but if you could just move that way a little bit further and I'd put a cross on the floor so the gaps weren't too big. And I used to call it my dance floor and I would create a choreography with the actors that was the first thing I'd do first thing in the morning and say, there's the scene, there's the space, you do it as you want. I'll alter it very slightly when I follow it with a camera. And then I let the cameraman follow it. And he'd go, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit loose there, it's a bit there. Okay, fine, we're going to move in. We put our marks down, actors marks, camera marks, different colored tapes or crosses. And then we'd send the actors away for makeup and wardrobe. And then we'd do the lighting and get ready, and then it was a fantastic way to shoot. It was an extraordinary thing. It was absolutely extraordinary that we just let us do it. We used to get on with it, and you know, we, 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 we wouldn't even rehearse it beforehand. We'd get on set and go and do it. So all of my people have to be good. Not just the main actors in the foreground, not just the secondary actors, but even the mods in the back have to know. So a good example of this is Mark Wingate. And there's another guy called Gary Cooper who is the tougher, older guy of the mods, who goes out with the Leslie Ash character. 
Mark Wingate, when he did his history, said he thinks he's tough, but he knows that I'm tougher than him, and next year I'm going to beat the fuck out of him. And also, I'm going to steal his girlfriend. And so when I'm with him, I'm, I'm going to just get a little close to him. You know, this is what I told him to do. Be close to him so that he, normally he comes in very strong, but just get a little too close to him so he has to turn away from you.